I've had my Steam Deck for about 14 months now, so I finally feel safe talking about it without having the fear of it breaking all over again. Although technically it's been 17 months since I got my first version, the one that unfortunately broke just 6 days after receiving it. My initial video about the deck ended up being a lengthy documentation of my resuscitation attempts rather than how I felt about it. But since then the deck has followed me around on commutes, local train rides and even overseas flights. During that time I've sometimes had good but sometimes also frustrating experiences with the deck and in this video I'm going to talk about both of those. Before we get into the nitty gritty, I know some of you might be interested in what actually happened to my original Steam Deck, so here's a brief recap. If you're interested in the other part, feel free to skip ahead using the markers down below. Okay, so just to summarize, I originally pre-ordered my deck on July 16th, 2021. Damn, time does fly. Anyhow, the actual purchase date was just about a year later, on the 11th of April 2022, before it finally shipped on the 13th. Hmm. Maybe that was a gnome I should have noticed. As some of you might know, I live in Switzerland, where the Steam Deck at the time was not officially available and therefore I used a US forwarding address to get the deck onto my doorsteps. This usually doesn't take all that long and on the 26th of the same month, exactly 13 days later… Oh dear, I really should have seen this coming. Anyhow, on April the 26th it finally arrived to my joyful excitement and as I was just heading to London for a trip, it was the perfect opportunity to test it out. Once I got back though, I plugged it in overnight where it quietly decided to remain dark, or to be more precise, the screen stopped functioning while still giving audible feedback that it was at least partially alive. I won't bore you with the extensive or rather desperate attempts at revival, if you want to know more about that, feel free to watch my other video which you can conveniently access by this little bubble thing on the top right here. Anyhow, not accepting that it was the mainboard, which it ended up being, I optimistically ordered a replacement screen and even went for the anti-reflective one. I had the 64GB version, so I thought it would not only fix the issue, but be a neat little upgrade as well. Unfortunately, the issues persisted and after some hesitation, I decided to finally give the whole RMA process a shot. But as I was afraid of getting caught by Valve for having purchased this from the land of cheese and chocolate, I tried to hide my true whereabouts by using a proxy, by which I mean a person on US soil. So I first sent it to a friend of mine who then shipped it to Valve using the return label. In the end, it did cost me a little extra, but just about 20 days later after Valve received it, which is a much better number, I got the information that my deck was making its triumphant return. I'm still surprised at how smoothly everything went, although maybe I just thought it might cause a problem and in reality Valve probably doesn't care all that much where the deck comes from, but just in case anyone else is in a similar situation, here's proof that it can work. All you need is a little patience and a friend in the US, which I'm very well aware of is easier said than done. Anyhow, I hope this little excursion gave you closure on the story of my original Steam Deck. Now, let's see what happened since. From the get-go I absolutely loved this thing. As I alluded to in my previous video, there's something magically weird about the ability to carry your entire Steam library with you, even if not everything is playable. If you're like me and have been on Steam for what seems like multiple lifetimes, it's an oddly comforting feeling seeing the familiar UI and games wherever you end up going, but more than that it allows you to play games that would normally never make it out of the living room or home. For example, on my trip to the land of maple leaves earlier this year, I spent an extensive amount of time playing Tales of Arise, an absolutely fantastic JRPG that was originally released on the PC, PlayStation 4, 5 and Xbox One Series X. This game was never meant to be played on the go, but fits so perfectly into a travel scenario. The automated battle system, if chosen, was a great match for short casual sessions, while still containing a full-blown experience, if I wanted to. That felt so much more fulfilling than comparable mobile games. Ultimately, this is the area where the Steam Deck for me, in terms of gameplay times, hits one of the biggest home runs. You get to play games on the go that you otherwise wouldn't. The second advantage is price, not only for the deck itself, which is very competitive in its power segment, but also for the games. I had numerous scenarios where I had to make a choice between Switch or deck. Sometimes I just couldn't justify the extra cost of the Switch, which can be 10 to 30% more, and if you're a little patient, you might get your title of choice in one of Steam's numerous sales events, 
which is really nice. Then there's a sheer amount of indie titles. I think most of us should be familiar with Steam more or less, and I'm sure you've encountered your fair share of them. Those can be infinitely fun, from small bite-sized distractions to incredibly extensive RPGs that can fill an entire season's worth of enjoyment. I'm not saying the Switch doesn't get them, it does, but I feel that the Steam just has a lot more of them. Good and, well, bad or weird ones as well. Having access to this library while being on the go is something I've grown to really appreciate. I don't play a lot of fast-paced shooters or action titles, I don't like the hectic movement and feel that during a trip or in a public space I'd rather wind down and play something more relaxing that doesn't attract too much attention. But even if I don't twist and turn in public, there are still some drawbacks related to twisting and turning, and those are in regards to the Steam Deck's size. After the novelty wore off a little bit, the question of whether or not to bring the deck along on every trip started to pop up more and more. It's bigger, right, and there's no secret about it, but I feel if you've never had to carry it around multiple times, it's a bit hard to grasp just how big it really is. I'm not a person who always carries a backpack, in fact I'm trying to avoid that most of the time, and it's probably obvious that the deck isn't meant to follow you in those scenarios. Get a playdate or an analog pocket if you need something more portable. I'm also aware that with the power the deck possesses, considering battery life and thermals, the size is somewhat warranted, but what I want to address here is less about the size to performance ratio and more about the pure portability of the device. It will fit most backpacks for sure, but depending on what else you bring along or what kind of setup you're rocking, you're gonna have to start playing the game of will it fit. For example, in my camera bag, which is the 30 liter Shimoda Action, I have the main compartments separated for my camera, lenses and other tech accessories. The deck with its rather voluminous case doesn't want to fit in anywhere. Yes, I am very well aware of the fact that I could just rearrange all the sections, but that would destroy the perfect arrangement that took me 6 million years to create. I often ended up just squeezing it at the top, which kinda works. I understand that this is a very personal issue. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who will see no problem at all with this and are more than happy to build their carry-on around the deck rather than trying to retrofit it, but I think it's something to keep in mind because there is the chance that the one time you don't bring it along might compound over time and then you don't bring it along again and again until it never joins you on a trip anymore and stays home forever. But you might say, the deck isn't just a mobile PC, it can replace everything. Just because you don't use it when being out and about doesn't mean you can't use it at home. Yes, that is 100% correct, but even though the deck is a very capable gaming device and even has the ability to be used as your main computing device itself, to me it is still primarily a mobile gaming PC. I never hooked it up to a bigger screen and it's because I'm fortunate enough to have a much more powerful PC at home, but also because Steam handles the transition between them so effortlessly. Just like on Nintendo's original, you can come home from your gamified commute, turn on your main rig and continue where you left off while getting the deck recharged for the next trip to the outer rim. That is, after Steam Cloud did its thing of course. The good news is that you get a better experience if your rig is more powerful, you have better controls arguably and sometimes even more features. The bad news is, while it's not as seamless as with the Switch where you don't need to do anything other than dock it, here you have to wait a little for your saves to sync across all devices, if it is supported, otherwise no fun shared times here. So it's not all fun and games, but when it works this almost seamless transition gave me early Switch vibes, which is a really cool thing. But this is essentially why I almost never use the deck at home, to meet a travel companion, which brings me back to the size problem, one that I try to remedy by discarding its original enclosure and replacing it with this. This is the brand's kill switch case, a safety rubbery if you will, it will ensure you can have fun wherever you go. It's a very popular choice, but even so, I was a bit hesitant at first, because it technically does bulk up the deck even more, but compared to the included carrying case, which also lacks a charging hole and purely acts as an enclosure, this one is smaller overall and has all the necessary cutouts to charge or get going immediately. It does come with a very lackluster stand though, it works, but only has two levels, either fully folded in or out, and there is no tension in between, which is a bit disappointing. Luckily, you can easily remove it and replace it with a weird universal mount that might come in handy if you need to fix your deck onto a stiff and pole-shaped object. There are also some built-in microSD card holders, but I ended up never using them as I got a 1TB drive the second I got the deck and never looked back. 
which by the way is another highly recommended thing to get. At the current SD card prices, something like this will or at least made me completely forget about storage worries. If you are wondering about performance, it's surprisingly competent and in the few comparisons I made, it actually ended up making no difference at all. Ironically, the only drawback of the kill switch case is concerning the SD card slot, because it's a bit hard for me to reach the tiny slot. Might just be my butterfingers though. I also got the travel cover, which works really well and is also much easier to store in an airplane seat than the bulky original case that takes way more precious legroom. But there are two issues with it. First, when taking it off, it can sometimes launch itself into space. <laughs> Secondly, it looks like a claymore. I never had an issue at airport security, but I feel that they don't like seeing this thing. Maybe it's just jealousy of how cool it looks though. Who knows? Lastly, we come to one of the most exciting parts of the Steam Deck and one that is 100% optional, but you're really missing out if you skip on this and it's really one of the best parts, and that's customization. There are so, so many things you can do with the deck, from hardware changes like translucent cases, storage upgrades, or the recently announced screen replacement that bumps up the resolution from 800 to 1200p and also improves the vibrancy. Although, I wish they would have increased the size as well. Sometimes I just really wonder what it would look like without any bezels and, oh well, wouldn't that be nice? You can also change the joysticks to Hall Effect ones to get that improved precision and permanently remove drift anxiety and these knobs if you like. I don't, I prefer the stock feel. But what really got me all giggly was the software mods you can undertake and in recent times it's gotten a lot more accessible. For example, at the beginning you could load up a second SD card with Windows to go, that's a version of Windows that can boot off an SD card in order to install all those pesky third party launchers like Xbox Game Pass or Battle.net, but in order to get controls working there was a whole thing with an overlay and well, never mind, it was annoying to set up and annoying to use. Nowadays, well, just get this launcher combo thing here, install it in desktop mode, and boom, you have all the launchers you would ever want in SteamOS. Neat. But that's not all. How about emulation? Again, previously this did cost a bit of setup time, but nowadays get Emudeck, a one-stop shop that installs everything you need. Of course, as always, you need to have the ROMs ready, but if you do, geez, playing Dreamcast games on this thing is a blissful joy. Where the analog pocket recreates 8 to 16-bit perfection, the Steam Deck, well, picks up right from there and, well, I have a really soft spot for Dreamcast. Not everything works perfectly though, there are occasional glitches, but sometimes the emulation feels even better than the official port on Steam itself. Overall this turns the Steam Deck into an unbelievable powerhouse, but I'm not done yet, there are even more customizations you can do. There's a plugin manager called Decky, which has a plethora of customizations you can change, the look of SteamOS, you can add Proton badges that give you an indication of how well a game is going to run outside of Valve's own verification badges, which aren't always a true indicator. Valve's patches will show games that they tested, but it doesn't cover everything. If you've ever played Steam or other games on a Linux system, that's where ProtonDB comes in. This is a fantastic resource that tells you just how good a game actually runs on Proton, which is the compatibility layer that allows these Windows games to be on Linux in the first place and therefore on the Steam Deck. But let's continue. Remember those additional launchers that we installed? Well, maybe you want to make them look a little sexier. Add a plugin called Steam Grid DB that does just that. And bam, you get yourself some neat looking icons. Don't like the animation when your Steam Deck turns on? Well, just change this using Animation Changer. Truly, just make the deck yours. Not everything is for visual enjoyment though, there are some really helpful plugins too. If you have the 64GB version of the deck like me and installed a truckload of games onto your 1TB SD card, the shader cache can fill up quite a bit until you get those storage warning signs. Before you had to boot up the deck in a specific way to clear it, now, you guessed it, there is a plugin for that called Storage Cleaner. Honestly, customizing the deck might be an entire subgenre of deck entertainment altogether, and it's only possible because there's such a great community behind it, and because Valve really embraces this, which is another one of the deck's biggest strengths, if you ask me, and something that could lead to a much longer lifespan than its competition. Since the release of the Steam Deck, the handheld PC or mobile gaming market has been stirred up quite a bit. There have been devices before, but after the Steam Deck, it changed. 
Everyone seems to be throwing their hat into the ring and I'm convinced that most of the competition isn't sure if what they have is actually what people want. I don't even know if the Steam Deck is what people want. To be honest, I'm still bothered by its size despite all the other benefits. For example, the Switch along with a battery pack, AirPods and a couple of other accessories including a wireless controller all fit into my travel bag. The deck would never fit in there and sometimes even with the kill switch case, it's still too big. Speaking of batteries, one last must if you take this thing along for a flight or along a trip is a chunky battery bank or a power plug. Also make sure that your bank or plug can supply enough power to keep the deck alive, otherwise SteamOS will annoy you about it. It's also cool if you see it on a display like on this Shark Geek Storm 2 Slim thingy here, which full disclosure was sent to me but it's still a cool gadget and actually works really well. I don't know where the whole mobile PC handheld market is going, but I believe that we are in a nice experimental phase. We are seeing more quirky and weird attempts at winning over customers again, and companies have so little clue that they're actually experimenting, which is to the benefit of everyone. But what I love most about Valve's approach is their hands-off attitude regarding what you do with their experiment. Just take this last plugin I'm showing you today called Vibrant Deck. From the get-go, I was a bit disappointed that the Steam Deck screen could not live up to the one on the Switch OLED and I'm still waiting for somebody to come up with an OLED replacement, but until then this allows you to tweak the screen saturation to get a little closer to it without costing anything at all. At first I didn't want to use it, thinking this would ruin the original game's intent, but after comparing the same game on both systems, I'm a believer. In the past or in the world of console gaming, everyone always said that the console lives and dies by the games. Content is king. The Steam Deck does not live by these rules, because whether or not it exists, PC games have been there before and they will continue to be there long after the deck's lifespan has ended. What will keep it relevant is continued support from both Valve, which has been great so far, but even more so of an active community, which I think sets the deck apart from every other PC handheld out there. If this remains, who knows how long the deck will stay alive. It might outlive us all. Hey, thank you so much for watching my probably too long video about the Steam Deck. Do you have one too? How was your experience with it? totally agree or do you think I'm all over the place? Let me know down in the comments below and especially if you have any tips for the deck, I'm very happy to hear it. I feel that even after all this time, I still know so little about this little wonder box. I left all the links to the plugins and some great tutorials on how to set up emu deck, decky and other things I've shown in the description down below. Anyway, enjoy pumpkin season, be safe and sound and see you in the next one. Bye.